This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to yet another episode of Tau Unbound. I'm Ido Aharoni, your host, and today it is my pleasure to host in our studio Michal Ziegelman. Hi, Ido. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, making the time to be with us here in the studio. And we're very excited to host you here. And uh, for the benefit of our viewers and listeners, let me tell you a little bit about Michal. Michal, who holds the Masters in, of Science, is a lecturer... at Tel Aviv University's esteemed College School of Management, and she is a lecturer in a program called LAHAV, which is executive training program, so she gets a chance to talk to um, top executives in the Israeli market. Yes, absolutely. And uh, in addition to that, she's also uh, teaching at the Adelson School of Entrepreneurship at Reichman University, and she's a member of the innovation team of the Israeli Chamber of Information Technology, ICIT, And there's a very long list of things, but the reason why we invited her, not only because she's uh, one of us, a lecturer at Tel Aviv University, but because she is the founder and the CEO of Duality, an Israeli strategic consulting company dedicated to helping organizations grow and prosper in disruptive markets. And we live in the age of disruption. Yes, absolutely. The age of COVID and the... Uh... All other disruptions. Yeah, so before we jump into the subject matter of your expertise, and we want to hear all about your system because I think it's more relevant than ever. It's a pleasure. Tell us about your upbringing and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Okay, uh, so I was born and raised in Tel Aviv. Uh, my early years were probably no different than many other Israelis uh, of my generation. My father was an architect, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. As a child, I was very interested in science, but also, of course, uh, like all Israelis, liked being in nature. I was driven by curiosity, which to this day has never abated. After high school, I was in a program that put me in university before my uh, mandatory military service. I received my uh, BA in physics, which I then went on to use during my uh, service in the Air Force. So you were one of those geniuses that were handpicked from <laughs> high school because, you know, <laughs> I remember. I More remember, a curious child. You know, I remember say, how yes. frustrating it was for people like me to meet people like you, <laughs> the people that were selected. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so... Uh, so you developed an, in, an interest in physics? Yes. And you applied that in, in the army. Can, can you say a few words about that? Is it, is it something you can share? Yes, of course. I will start a little bit earlier when my uh, passion for science uh, sparked. It sparked at a very early age, about around five or six years old, when my mother told me the story of the scientist Marie Curie. Wow. I was fascinated by the idea of becoming a researcher. And uh, for my sixth birthday, while most of my girlfriends got Barbie dolls, I asked for a professional microscope. Uh, that's how my uh, first laboratory was established. And my interest in science has never stopped since then. Uh, in high school, I uh, chose physics and math as my core subjects. And it became clear that my academic path would be in, uh, in science and later in physics. Tel Aviv University was my academic home. So uh, in the army service, during the army service, I applied uh, physics uh, laws, especially mechanics, uh, in uh, Air Force simulation, which, which was very exciting for me. Uh, I think that's the first time uh, that I met myself thinking about how to apply the rules and, and laws of nature in uh, everyday life. In that case, it was in the army service and uh, the topics, uh, uh, the relative topics. But later it went on uh, in searching how to bring these, uh, those uh, laws uh, to everyday life in business. Now... Your entire business approach, which we will talk about, is a combination of two things that are not 
that you could say are counterintuitive, right? The first Absolutely. is the need to always have a strategy, which means to have a long-term organizing principle to guide everything that you do, and then simultaneously to be able to improvise and maneuver. Yes. At the same time you're doing that. So what seemingly looks like two contradicting forces are actually the key to success and to the ability to manage crisis. Yes, absolutely. I would say that it began a little bit earlier, uh, finding the connection, realizing the connection between physics and uh, business and leadership or between uh, art and science in general. So in general, physics, the study of uh, matter, motion, energy and force, Uh, deals with the uh, basic and fundamental laws of nature and how systems interact. It was during my MSC research when I realized that all systems, including organizations, communities, economies, are what I call natural systems. And as such are uh, governed by the very same laws as ecosystems in, nas- in nature. Now, this event, this insight was an eye-opening for me because what does it really mean? It means that phenomena like a constant change, uncertainty, chaos, unpredicted events, etc., are inherent in business and economic environments the same way they are inherent in nature. So the meaning is that uh, change and disruption are inevitable. Even more, change is a hallmark of life because let's think, for example, uh, uh, of companies like Nokia and Blockbuster and that uh, did not manage to change and innovate. They, like many others like them, became obsolete and died. So the basic insight here is that order together with this order are the natural inherent changes duality of all systems both in nature and in business so change is a, is the only permanent it's the only permanent that's right and so how do you prepare to obviously I mean we are still under the influence of the watershed moment of, of October 7th of 107 obviously it's impossible maybe it is possible for systems to be prepared for things like that So how do you do that in practice? How do you bring the two elements? The, how, how does the duality look like in practice? Okay, a, a typical duality program is, a, is a, um, an executive training program, usually formatted as a course of four to six sessions or as a one to two day workshop. These workshops uh, focus on uh, management topics like redefining strategy, accelerating innovation, uh, improving uh, competitiveness in, with a focus on disruptive and uncertain environments, these environments that we live uh, and uh, know today. Their purpose is to broaden the traditional management perception and to make use of a unique set of tools of the bimodal management uh, method that I developed during my uh, physics research and later uh, during uh, my uh, business in duality company and uh, to make use of these tools uh, to to enable leaders and executives take them later into their life and uh, to solve uh, uh, contemporary disruptive challenges so let's take a couple of you know you mentioned a couple of examples you mentioned I believe Nokia and blockbuster to that I could add you know Kodak and uh, many many like them and Blackberry and there's so many companies that were on the top of their games and they eroded because they could not foresee the changes um, so let's use one of those case, case studies to analyze what they could have done differently and so what is it on a you On, a, on an organizational and even on a societal level that a society or an organization can do to really force themselves to be mentally attuned to changes. Okay, this brings us uh, to uh, talk a little bit about the essence of uh, the bimodal management model which I developed. 
The bimodal management model, uh, as we can see from its very name, uh, involves two different styles of competence, planning and agility. Planning encompasses a set of skills such as uh, setting clear goals, strategy, measurement, analytics, risk control, etc. Skills that, we, that are very well established in uh, traditional management concept. The other mode, the second mode, agility, involves skills like such as um, recognizing uh, recognition, um, a network mindset, Uh, risk taking, adaptability, flexibility, etc. While the, while the planning mode is well known in traditional management perception, the agility mode is much less is addressed much less in uh, the conventional management perception. But the point is that these tools are crucial for leaders and managers to, respond effectively in uh, today's uh, challenging environments. So the bimodal management model suggests that leaders and executives need to apply both modes, planning and agility simultaneously to respond effectively Now, in a disruptive and ever-changing environment. Now what you're saying is that Uh, there are plenty of people that write about and teach how to plan. Uh, much fewer people are teaching how to think you know creatively and to be to develop this agility that you're talking about. Is it something that you can teach people how to do? Um, of course, uh, let's say that uh, first of all, we are used to uh, think about Israelis as Israelis as, as very good in improvising. And uh, less good in uh, the long-term thinking while to my in my opinion uh, the situation is that um, Israeli businesses uh, often often operate in a survival mode prioritizing the long share the long-term solutions and the urgent over the important and the I think that it's not because we don't uh, appreciate or we don't acknowledge the long-term thinking. I believe that managers, uh, if, let's say it like this, if managers had the practical tools and clear strategy to deal with disruption and change, they will be free to develop their long-term thinking. I think... Israeli managers and business managers in, the, in general, they understand very well the need to develop a long-term strategy because after all, uh, most traditional management uh, training focus exactly on that point. So the problem is is not a lack of understanding, I think. In my humble opinion, I believe that uh, the problem is a lack of practical tools. To deal with chaos and disruption and that's exactly what the bimodal management does it equips management with a set of practical and highly effective tools to deal with constant change these tools become an everyday part of their management agenda and they are applied on a continuous basis uh, ensuring that uh, urgent matters are consistently addressed and Now, this is the Israeli culture, right? So you described very, I think, accurately the, what's happening in Israel. In Israel, people are very strong in improvising, making decisions uh, as we go along. And I think that that's why Israeli first responders are so effective. And we saw that after 10-7. And that's why recovery in Israel is so quick. And that's why Israeli communities are so resilient. I remember during the high days of the second Intifada, guests would, that would come to visit were amazed how quickly Israelis recover after bombings and attacks and so on. Uh, what's happening elsewhere in other cultures? Let's talk about maybe the North American culture or the European culture. Oh, so when, when we think uh, of other cultures, um, countries like Singapore and UAE, Uh, come come to mind uh, as small countries like Israel that excel in the long-term thinking. 
Uh, so let's uh, see in uh, UAE, uh, UAE uh, the, um, they usually, um, they, they, they created a, a new role, uh, the Minister for Artificial Intelligence. This is part of their 2031 AI strategy, artificial intelligence strategy. Now, I would love to see Israel uh, defining its uh, AI strategy for the long term for the, the upcoming decade. Uh, in Singapore, if we see what's, the, what's happening there, they choose the best people, uh, the best experts in economics, pay them huge uh, salaries to put them as top people in government agencies. Again, this is part of the long term strategy. Singapore is also known for its robust uh, innovation ecosystem supported by government uh, policies, uh, academic institutions, and a very strong startup uh, culture. Now, Israel can learn here also um, how to uh, nurture innovation uh, ecosystem supported by government uh, support for startups uh, to become an innovative uh, leader uh, and compete in the global market. Now, your system is allowing ma managers to find this equilibrium, this balance, right, between the two. Yes. Um, what are the tools that you would recommend to any leader of an organization, of a, of a, of a society, of an economy, to um, introduce ways to be innovative? Because this is what I see from my point of view. And I'm, and I'm working with very large companies. Even companies that were founded on a very innovative DNA, like a technology company, once they grow, um, they become a bureaucracy. And the definition of bureaucracy is that sometimes procedure overrides substance. In other words, the procedure becomes more important than the actual reason why the company exists. And... How, what, what can be done in organizations to reintroduce innovative thinking in large organizations? So that's a very interesting uh, question. We can see an example from Amazon. For example, uh, I think the bimodal uh, concept or the duality concept is embedded in Amazon uh, leadership philosophy, which focuses on one hand on the long-term thinking and strategy, uh, that shows up in uh, working backwards and uh, starting every development with the press release, the future press release. But at the same time, they are they excel in maintaining uh, the culture of day one. Uh, every day is day one and customer obsession, which uh, requires a very high level of agility from an organization to, to hold these two uh, modes together. And that's exactly the uh, essence of the bimodal management uh, model, how you, uh, you develop your agility as a strategy, agility as a strategy, and apply it on an everyday basis, on a regular basis, and at the same time, simultaneously, uh, driving your long-term objectives. And so I think when you mentioned the day one philosophy is that every day it's as if it's the first day of the company. Yes, yeah, like a startup and it becomes more and more challenging when the company is grown up, as you say. Now, innovation, we know very good that all kinds of innovation is disruptive for the organization. It's necessary uh, to compete in today's disruptive and digital and ever-changing world, but at the same time, innovation is disruptive, and the organization uh, needs uh, must be willing to uh, address and to deal with this disruption and this uh, 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 changing minds and uh, and um, challenging uh, basic assumptions and so on in order to innovate. Now, in your work with organizations, what would you say is the number one internal impediment, internal obstacle uh, in the process of introducing your model? The first thing I believe is acknowledging that we live in a complex environment 
in a network world that uh, there are so many changes and so many disruptions that are interconnected And uh, once the organization understand and the management and well understand uh, the, the uh, meaning of a complex system, that uh, every change is the uh, beginning of another change and you cannot control changes and you cannot avoid disruptions and you cannot avoid the competition. So if you don't step forward, you really actually go backward. And we have no other choice but to innovate. But it starts with a recognition of the complexity of our environments and with recognition of uh, global changes, global trends, uh, to be w- very aware on a constant basis, not just once or twice a year uh, when uh, the uh, uh, management uh, sit together, but uh, to, to build the ob- to define the ob- future objectives, but to be clear aware of these changes and the uh, global trends on an on a regular basis now AI causes a lot of fear and confusion and people don't really understand what it is they hear from pundits that it could be a force for good but also they hear all those bleak uh, assessments how AI could completely disrupt our lives and create chaos and Um, unparalleled chaos in the history of humankind. How do you communicate that to managers? Uh, because I know that a big part of your work is to prepare organizations to deal with the reality that will be dominated by machine learning, artificial intelligence. Yes, absolutely. I, I think AI is a huge opportunity to humanity in general and to uh, businesses, but at the same time is a huge it's a huge and youth and, uh, and new threat. And uh, leaders, business leaders should be aware of both of them. So I think part of the discussion uh, would be, opportunities and threats and being aware of the uh, ethic ethical uh, threats and uh, and the uh, data uh, privacy and so on so this is one point to be aware of both of them the threats uh, together with the opportunities another thing that we see a lot today is that uh, so many businesses adopt AI a uh, Practically, they adopt uh, AI applications to make their lives and business more effective, more productive, to automate uh, uh, um, processes. It can, it, can, it can be a huge benefit for the short term, but thinking on the long-term objectives, uh, the adoption of AI should be strategic, a strategic process. An organization should, uh, must think about the long-term objectives to explore how AI can improve these objectives and uh, to, 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 uh, um, to be in accordance with uh, the, the strategic objectives of the organization and make a strategic process. Part of this uh, strategic process would be um, analyzing threats and the uh, uh, ethical uh, aspects and the uh, uh, social aspects and uh, how it uh, affects employees and so on. What I want to say is that the adoption of AI into an organization is a strategic process. Unfortunately, most of the processes that I see today are tactical processes. We adopt one or two or other uh, AI application, and uh, yes, we are more productive. We uh, improve our customer service, but if we think for the long run, it should be a strategic process. Now, you mentioned the strategy versus tactics, and you know many of, of our viewers and, and listeners are are interested in having a, a, a clearer definition of the differences between the two. And I know that at least in Israel, there's a great deal of confusion between the meaning of strategy and tactics. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that many Israelis served in the army 
and the army is all about details and the army is all about you know checklists and yes. so on that they tell you that God is in the details and so on and it's very easy to lose sight of the big picture uh, so and we we know that not all the important decisions are strategic decisions as you said there's a tendency to prioritize the urgent over the important especially in a disruptive environment exactly so how would you clarify the difference between the two for our viewers and listeners if we think of uh, uh, the strategic aspect uh, strategy is concerned and, uh, and strategy deals with the organization long-term objectives and Where do we want to go? Uh, what is our mission? Uh, what's important for us to bring to the world? Uh, what's important for us uh, to bring to our what, what's the value? What's the value prof- proposition for our customers? And uh, once an organization is focused on the long-term strategy, uh, it's about how do we achieve our long-term objectives in order to create value, to be competitive, and so, and so on. The long-term short, the tactic, tactical uh, um, aspect, deals with how uh, sometimes how we put out fires and how we uh, deal with the urgent, and especially today in our disruptive worlds, world the agent is uh, takes a, a bigger and bigger part because it's not a change once in a while it's a const it's a constant change that happens all the time that's why I believe that the bimodal management can bring value here as it encourages the executives uh, to develop agility on a regular basis and at the same time not instead of at the same time, Uh, taking care and developing uh, their long-term thinking. I think we, we must uh, balance between the two of them in order to um, be productive and to create value for all. Yeah. And I think that what you're saying is critically important for the well-being, the preservation, and the growth of companies and organizations. And you know we we could um, have this conversation for hours because you know, as you could tell, I'm very interested in in what you're doing, and I'm very interested in what's happening in organizations and how organizations are prepared to deal with change. But unfortunately, we're limited in time. I wanted to thank you for spending time with us here in the studio. Thank you, Rido. It was my pleasure. Thank you for educating us and teaching us about your um, really well-needed model. And uh, hopefully uh, our friends and the supporters of the universities um, heard your vision and will probably reach out and maybe sign up to, uh, to become your students at the Caller School of Management. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. And to our viewers and listeners uh, at home, uh, I'd like to say goodbye from Tel Aviv until our next episode.